afternoon, all. Thank you for attending Incentivizing ICS Cyber Protection Through Insurance. My name is EJ Von Schomburg. I am the Vice President of Partner Alliances for a company called Red Bison, and Red Bison designs and manages networks that go into commercial real estate properties. Um, I am so honored and pleased to be a part of the IoT world. Thank you, Lucian. Uh, we're, we're actually honored to have two different Lucians amongst our presence. So today we have Lucian Niemeyer, who's the CEO of Building Cybersecurity, a nonprofit, and we'll go through what that is. And we also have Ken Kurse, who's a vice president of a small but mighty commercial office property entity headquartered out of uh, Washington, D.C. So Lucian, let me throw it over to you to introduce yourself. Yeah, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Lucian Fagaris. Uh, what I've seen so far today has been an outstanding set of speakers on on the celebration of uh, Cybersecurity Month. So uh, my hat's off to Lucian. We love our relationship with IoT World. Uh, we think we, we have the ability to reach out to thousands of folks uh, through his platform and through his, uh, his work. So I really wanna do a shout out for all the hard work that uh, Lucian Pagaros and his staff puts together uh, for these webinars. And I'm really hoping to get inv invited back to more um, particularly given the fact that I just basically told the world how great you are. Um, so anyway, uh, so I just want to say uh, 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 thanks, EJ. Um, uh, I can't imagine being on with a better couple of guys than EJ and Ken talking about what we're trying to do to revolutionize and modernize how we look at cybersecurity in the built environment, starting with uh, commercial real estate. For those of you who've never um, heard of us or heard of me, I'm a, my background is I'm coming at it from the national security angle. Um, where I've spent most of my time in either the military uh, in the United States Senate or more recently um, as an assistant secretary of defense uh, running the largest real estate portfolio in the world, where I was directly asked uh, by the secretary of defense, hey, you got to get after um, the cybersecurity and safety of the devices and the operational technologies and uh, all the control systems that we rely on for nat national security, as well as um, what we have put into our society and that makes us in some cases more beneficial, more convenient, you know, uh, connected and smart operational technologies in our homes and our cars um, and our transportation systems and our buildings are great. Um, but as Ken knows from his background, they offer also potentially unique uh, vectors of cyber um, uh, nefariousness, uh, cyber uh, incidents. So um, I think that's what we want to talk about is the OT and particularly uh, what we've been working on in commercial real estate and really ending with what we're seeing in our collaboration within BCS, with the insurance industry, how insurance is waking up um, to the cyber security threat, specifically the OT threat, and wanting to find out more, more ways to mitigate risk for uh, clients. So Ken, that's a, a good intro um, to, to, to open it up to you. And then uh, we'd love to get into some questions that EJ's got. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Lucian, EJ. Um, and again, the other Lucian uh, looks like a great agenda today. Uh, really appreciate the invite. Um, so Ken Kurz, I'm the Vice President of IT and CIO at Corporate Office Properties Trust. We are a commercial office uh, REIT headquartered in Columbia, Maryland, close to DC and Baltimore, as, as EJ mentioned. Um, we have about 22 million square feet um, in our portfolio, about 160, 170 buildings. Um, we do uh, pri primarily our revenue is generated through support to the Department of Defense, U.S. government, um, defense contractors, as well as um, some more traditional commercial office. And uh, we also have a line of business for data center shells. Um, you know, as you mentioned, cybersecurity is a big issue for us. Um, I did not grow up in real estate. I grew up in the national security sector, um, been in higher ed, been in the nonprofit world. Um, and, and so really we're sort of, you know, this has been a new and emerging area and threat over the last five to 10 years. And uh, we're really starting, just starting to wrap our arms around it. The building cybersecurity folks have been hard at work with respect to um, some controls and frameworks that are more far more tailored to towards the built environment that we can um, apply in the real world than than necessarily exist out there, and so we've been uh, working uh, you know as an asset owner operator, really working hard to see what that looks like, and um, will be some of what we talk about today. Hey, hey EJ, I think one thing we want to note up front: we got over about over 130 folks on the line today. Um, I know I'll be monitoring, and I know EJ, you're probably going to want to monitor and Ken yes. what's coming in on either chat or Q and A. I prefer to use chat because I'd also like to push out some information about BCS while we're talking. Um, so, mm -hmm. folks who are on the line, 
um, can either submit a, a question to us or a comment through both uh, either chat or Q&A, whichever one works best for you. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. And I'll keep monitoring it on this side as well. So Lucian, just why don't you give a little more history of building cyber security and, and what we're doing very practically in the commercial real estate as the first industry segment? Yeah, sure thing. And first of all, I, I mean, uh, it's, it's a passion. I think once you realize, and, and, and again, Ken and I have spent a lot of time you know, inside the Department of Defense understanding there, there is an acute threat we face as a society. Um, and as you know, cybersecurity is a huge word, um, and most folks are looking at, you know, recovering or uh, from cyber ransomware attacks or other incidents um, involving software. What I focused on years ago, and, and eventually, um, when you're a citizen secretary of defense, you, you call them, meaning people show up, um, started uh, bringing a group together of some of the control system manufacturers of the world, the Siemens, Johnson Controls, uh, you know, uh, Honeywell, Rockwells, all these uh, organizations, uh, companies and ask the fundamental question, how do we collectively work on reducing cyber risk to the controls that you're putting into everything in our society? Um, you know, people don't realize there's 3000 microchips in a car these days, and yet we don't have a safety light that says, hey, someone's messing with your data. So we have a fundamental disconnect between where we're going as a society with more technology and the need to, to engineer cyber security and cyber safety into these smart devices. Whether it's your smart coffee maker, your smart uh, baby monitor, um, your TV, your car. I mean, we're, we need to ask ourselves, what is the national set of standards that we need, we should be looking at? Um, so basically, uh, we, I, we, we started the Department of Defense, realized that we needed to face outward. Um, I, I, we, I took the work we were doing in DOD with that working group and, uh, and, and, uh, and saw a first market application for commercial real estate and was born a nonprofit right at the beginning of the pandemic called Building Cybersecurity. And our, and our goal and our dream, and, and uh, EJ, you know this as well as anybody, we want to create the world's premier OT performance standard. And so we formed some partnerships that we think are critical for us. One is the society, uh, International Society for Automation. From our perspective, they have the pre world's premier technology standard, 6443. So our goal was take the best of NIST, take the best of, that ISA has, and build a performance framework. So it's not just the technologies you choose, which is ISA, but how you design and integrate them, and ultimately how you maintain and operate them over um, the life cycle of an asset. And we believe, unlike any other organization, that insurance is key to that. That as the cyber threat grows in the OT space, there is going to be more claims, either from for, uh, cyber insurance policies or more importantly, property and casualty claims. But as we see OT attacks destroy things or hurt people. So we, we are clearly believe that there, sh that there will be eventually, and there is now an insurance incentive to, to want to drive down risk in the operational technology we're putting, putting in all around us by adopting some type of national framework that protects those uh, uh, technologies uh, as long as we're using them. Ken, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think one of the things that we've really struggled with since I've been with Copter over the last six to seven years, right, is, you know, we lease a lot of space um, to the government, and, you know, and to a variety of tenants. Um, you know, the government does a very good job as far as having a set of requirements, which it requires for if they're going to go build a building and the systems they're going to put in it. Um, but oh, those requirements don't necessarily get passed on to us as a defense contractor or, or a, you know, a facility that's being leased, that they could be performing some mission critical activity, something that's uh, extremely sensitive from a national security perspective. And so we live in that space and want to make sure that we're at least meeting or exceeding those standards on behalf of not only the country, but our, but our tenants that are occupying that space. And, and we have a very symbiotic relationship. And so the fact that we really don't have these standards, um, we've got a bunch of conflicting capabilities, or not really capabilities, but frameworks that overlap in many ways. And um, building cybersecurity has really been the first one to, you know, as, as Lucian said, to try and take sort of the, the best of NIST, the best of CIS, best of 6443, and so on, and apply it to the built environment, which is why we're so um, interested in seeing it succeed. I appreciate yeah. that. One thing I want to point out, EJ, and you know this as well as I do, we're, we picked commercial real estate um, not because it's the most challenged or the most, uh, you know, or tends presents the, the biggest threat. Obviously, water systems are a threat. Oil and gas is a threat. 
Um, and there are some pretty significant critical infrastructures. We picked it because it was kind of the easiest to do and there's a huge insurance incentive. We definitely, as an organization, PCS, want to grow that framework into water systems, into transportation systems, into industrial ICS, um, into healthcare, huge, huge concern in healthcare. So uh, I don't wanna give folks on the call the impression that we're just for buildings. No, um, we're a new organization that's growing quickly into other, other industries that need to have some type of national OT standard. And the other thing I, I would add there too, um, Lucian, is that one of the drums that I continue to beat that is, I think is important for this crowd, right, is that, you know, there's a lot, there's been books written, there's 60 minute specials, we talk a lot about the security of the power grid, um, uh, water filtration, um, all, you know, things on the generation side, right, from a utility perspective or critical infrastructure point of view, but at the end of the day, we're on the demand side. Right. There's a we're very different from the standpoint of the types of controls that we put into our buildings versus what's out in an oil field or a refinery or um, at a dam. But it's still an end to end system. Right. And, you know, from an adversarial perspective, it's a lot easier to take out a facility that has a mission critical activity uh, sitting with taking place within it than um, the northeast power grid. Right. Um, not only for what you're going after, but also sort of the effects of um, conducting that action on society. So, you know, we do live in a, in a very uh, unique but targetable, sp targetable space. Absolutely. One, one thing I wanna add, add to that, by the way, I think we're gonna kick EJ off the call here in a minute because I think Ken and I just can keep going. <laughs> so it's so okay. one thing is, also, is look, Ken, you and I have been around this for a while. A lot of people are talking about it, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I can't tell you how many webinars I've been where we got a problem, we got a problem, we've got this problem. Oh, no, you gotta think about this problem. Okay, I, what I was told the Department of Defense is stop admiring the problem and, and come up with a damn solution and fast. So that's one thing I want to point out for the folks in the audience is we're not here to talk and to scare the crap out of you for the next hour. I think you've gotten that earlier in the day. We're here to say, look, we put a lot of work in a solution you know, and we, we believe we have it. Now the goal is to raise awareness that what we have and ultimately to start uh, actually implementing it. Yeah, and I'll add in there the practical guide to what building cyber has done on the technical side is we looked at all the standards that exist and, and you mentioned ISA 62443 as the fundamental baseline for the OT side. And then we also looked at NIST and Center for Internet Security and all of those are excellent standards, but it doesn't give a practical guide for Ken's peers. And, and Ken is at a different level from a cybersecurity in most of the built world or the commercial real estate world. Most folks that own real estate really don't understand the threat. Ken has had to because of his tenant base at a different level, I would say. You know, but what we did was we went through all of those standards and then pulled out the appropriate controls and requirements to create a specific profile for commercial real estate. And the idea is to create a practical guide to take organizations that have no maturity to ones that have a high level of cyber security maturity in their processes and allow them to move up that flow from a bronze, silver, platinum, and gold. So, you know, looking at 62443 may be like climb, climbing, climbing Mount Everest, but we allow for a practical guide of 200 and some odd controls to help guys do that. The intent for building cyber will be to replicate those profiles for other industry segments at some time. Um, one of the things that, you know, in the name of our session here is incentivizing insurance. Lucian, can you touch on what we've done from building cyber with respect to the leadership from the insurance side and how we drive that? First of all, yeah, absolutely. And um, when we uh, created the nonprofit, one of our founding um, entities was um, the largest insurance broker in the world, Aon. And I have to give them a lot of credit um, they've seen, you know, the cyber landscape evolving quickly. And, and so they saw what we were doing um, and the leadership there said, you know, you're on to something. So we, we basically have been using them um, and others, you know, to some degree, Marsh and Willis, um, to talk to underwriters about what they would really like to see. Our framework performs two functions. First of all, um, it's an assessment tool. So uh, an insurer or anybody can come in and says, hey, we want to be assessed to determine where our gaps are um, and, and where we think we have vulnerabilities and how do we fix those. All right, that gives you an assessment. 
We then also offer, if an insurer wants it, a certification. And that is to validate that you are a, you installed either hardware or software to mitigate those gaps or reduce that, that risk. Um, and that you are maintaining those over uh, over time. So it's it's uh, so the certification would not necessarily be an audit. It's a real time basic technology, you know, app, uh, some type of uh, of, um, of operation center or some other type of method by which you are validating that the controls you said you were you told your insurer and told your CEO that you were going to implement it is being implemented by both the facility managers and the IT staff. That's the key here. IT and OT is converging, and but there is a common a uh, set of goals that you want to maintain and has to be sustained in order to maintain to, to be to maintain a certification in the rating you have and that rating can be cyber bronze cyber silver cyber gold that's really what the team has done taken taken 6443 and created an easy to understand level of capabilities that you need to achieve to get to a certain level of which then would feed back to favorable consideration during your next insurance renewal yeah, and going through this, you know, if you look at the insurance industry as a whole, traditionally there has been property and casualty and DNO insurance and cyber, right? Give some thoughts on how those things are starting to blend with what attacks on OT can do from the PNC side versus cyber. Yeah, so so really, you know, you look at a, a cyber attack, mostly a ransomware attacks, and they're, and they're being filed as a cyber insurance claim. Um, the concern is, is that it's rapidly evolving. Now, the war in Ukraine has um, changed the dynamic a little bit, uh, but event, but at before the war, and even now, it's starting to tick back up. Uh, ransomware attacks uh, de definitely cause devastation in the cyber insurance market, uh, to the point where there's a lot of volatility over the. Okay, what should we be charging for premiums for? What's the cost of a deductible? But most importantly, what um, what are, what are the exclusions, which are continuing to grow and expand and it's getting to the point, I, and I hate to say this from my perspective, I know we've all gotten calls about that aftermarket, you know, car warranty or home warranty um, that's got exclusions the size of Delaware. Um, but I, I believe we're starting to see that kind of emerge. So one of the things I definitely recommend for anybody in this call um, that has um, a, a, any access or involvement with cyber insurance is check your policy, particularly if it's been renewed, because you're starting to see cyber insurance cover less and less. Um, so then, then what happens when you have an OT attack to an elevator or to a thermostat or to a fire control that drops water on all your, the, the equipment in your, in your tenant, uh, on your tenant's equipment in the building? How do you file a claim? Is it a cyber insurance claim or is it a property claim? Uh, so that, that's the, what people are starting to see now is it's starting to more become a property and a casualty issue um, that drives the need for instruments in the PNC area, which as of right now are immature. So if you can't transfer a risk, What's the next thing you do? You got to mitigate risk or you assume it. Um, so that's where, really where our BCS framework comes in is to mitigate that company, that company risk on the OT side. And, and Ken, you've been one of the founding beta testers for BCS. Can you give the audience a little glimpse of at least the first dry run we've done with the framework on one of your assets? Sure. So um, we took uh, one of our, ass our office assets, uh, the Transamerica building at 100 Lake Street in downtown Baltimore. So it's a 38 story building, um, has a few thousand IP enabled endpoints inside that building and, and sat down to um, go through this process, right? That, that Lucian and AJ are talking about and really wanted to, um, you know, see if that BCS framework would survive first contact, um, you know, aside from going through it from more of a tabletop uh, sort of exercise when we're sitting in a building. And so, you know, we felt that fundamentally it was very, very well time spent, um, you know, that uh, to have some OT expertise from outside the company coming in, you know, as part of BCS uh, to, you know, really challenge some of our engineers um, uh, around the table, right? From an IT perspective, we don't always know what to ask. And so we got a lot of valuable information just from the dialogue back and forth with respect to going through the process. Um, again, I would stress that uh, the BCS really has what no other, no other framework does as it relates to um, commercial real estate and the types of technologies that, that, are, that are in the built environment. Um, and I think you know, there's uh, some education that needs to happen from a community standpoint that this really, there's a difference between auditing and assessing um, right where you know from an audit standpoint, um, folks feel they're going to be held accountable. 
um, for, you know, you may lose your job, you may lose your bonus or whatever. Um, really, uh, we view this as a, a partnership to assess our facility to see where things are at, right? Um, now, that's not to say that, you know, we scored perfect. Uh, you know, we may be ahead of the game, as EJ said, but buildings like 100 Light, you know, you may think that, hey, we have all this national security related stuff that we're doing at COPT. Um, but buildings that are like 100 Light are actually probably higher on my radar. And while it se may seem counterintuitive, I think from a, from a risk standpoint, if we were, if that building were to be subject to um, uh, an attack, a cyber attack that would make the building uninhabitable, let's say there's a ransomware attack on the web supervisor or the PLCs, you know, somehow have an, uh, ex you know, some sort of something that's exploited within them that, that either causes the building to be evacuated or makes the building uninhabitable from a code standpoint for an extended period of time is far more visible from a um, reputational damage point of view. Uh, you have more greater issues with tenants. We have something that's very visible in, in you know, downtown of Baltimore and um, something our uh, board and our shareholders would be very um, interested in, right? And so, you know, we spend a lot of time with our board discussing sort of the idea of audit risk as a publicly traded company around Sarbanes-Oxley and so on to asset risk, right? We have about five and a half billion dollars worth of assets on the books that gets to the PNC discussion and, and so on and so forth that really, you know, it's like, like Lucian said, we either need to accept um, or mitigate uh, that risk and, and kind of move on. And so, you know, cyber insurance policies are becoming more and more expensive. They're becoming more and more difficult. They have more and more exclusions, right? And, you know, this last uh, renewal that we just went through about a month or two ago, um, for the first time in, in my career, I've seen questions on there with respect to, do you have IT and OT systems in these facilities? And then questions around, are the network segmented specific to that and, and so on and so forth. And also we ended up submitting a two page narrative with respect to what our security architecture looks like in support of this um, questionnaire that was already an addendum on top of the original set of questions, right? So th even the underwriters have moved away from where they used to be years ago, where you'd have five, six cybersecurity related questions, and then you kind of move on with your life. Um, because of the pervasive, pervasiveness of attacks, they have to recoup many of those losses over the last few years, and we're all paying for it. Um, and it's, it's just going to get harder and harder moving forward. But we do believe that having some, again, a framework, a standard, um, hopefully accepted by the insurance industry that can demonstrate our proficiency, uh, more so than just uh, signing off and sort of self-certifying, as well as being able to demonstrate to our leadership, our board, our shareholders, and so on, that we um, are making the correct investments with respect to cybersecurity. Um, I think there's there's a lot uh, a lot to offer here. I appreciate that. Uh, I think one thing to add there is that um, we see this growing. You know, you know it's not just uh, where Ken has used us, and and by the way, thank you, Ken. You know, but and we, we continually pray that you'll never have an uh, have had an OT tag based on your involvement with BCS. There is prayer sometimes involved with that, um, because you know it's no guarantee. Uh, but we've got another major property owner, a uh, property owner in the United States, multi-billion dollar portfolio, one of the leading one of the leaders in, in smart technology and buildings. And what they're seeing is not just a need to take a look at what they've got in their current inventory, but they're asking uh, BCS to apply the framework to a cyber commissioning. We don't talk about that enough um, in our industry, which is not just how do we bolt on cybersecurity and cyber safety to a brownfield of element, but what do you need to engineer in and what do you need to ensure as the building is being constructed on how the controls are configured, wireless or wired, how they're integrated, how they're operating together. Um, so, it, so the framework can be used in a variety of different ways not just for an assessment of a current facility, but what, how should a building be configured and commissioned at the time it's turned over to the tenants. Um, so we have that project going on, which is amazing. Another great supporter of our framework who is investing in us and saying, give me a commissioning plan and then give me a certification after that uh, for, for a huge high rise um, uh, that's going up um, uh, in the country. So, so that is another way to use a framework. And then we're also working uh, with the United States Air Force on taking our framework and seeing where we can add value to what they already have for cybersecurity controls and, and systems and programs 
at a major uh, U.S. base uh, down in Florida that got wiped out by a hurricane in 2018. So there's about four and a half billion dollars of construction going there. And we've been asked to come in saying, hey, uh, use your expertise within this nonprofit um, and and tell us where we have gaps. And I want to point something out because I get I get clobbered because I've got to be the stupidest person in the world to be running a cybersecurity nonprofit. Uh, when there's so much money out there in the for-profit world. Um, I really, uh, we really believe in BCS that it needs to be an objective industry-led coalition or a body that maintains cybersecurity standards and updates those as the threat evolves um, in order to be able to stay on top of it you know, and, and make those changes without having to uh, you know, be accused of doing it for a profit. So that is why BCS will and stay a nonprofit organization to be that national uh, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, maintainer of the framework, the performance framework we've developed to date. And the one thing I would add there too, that I think is key just to sort of footstop, right? Is the fact that, you know, we're talking about bolting it on or, or baking it in versus bolting it on, right? So, you know, again, started off in the DOD many years ago, the 20 years I've been in cybersecurity, we used to say the exact same thing. And it was always very, very difficult to get people to accept that guidance um, sort of at the beginning. Uh, you put a standard, you can put it in the lease, you can um, work it out with uh, your providers and so on and so forth and, and, and apply these controls. I mean, that's really where we're trying to go, right? It's not even so much do the assessment to get hopefully get your discount or be able to get your um, insurance policy. It's how do you take these take the structure, take these requirements, take this knowledge and, and integrate it, you know, pre-commissioning in the construction process. Um, you know, we do have a huge brownfield problem, no doubt, but we also have to look forward as to how we're going to, um, you know, what can we do today to affect those systems that are going to be sitting in those buildings for the next 40, 50 years. And, you know, once they're in, we can't touch them. Yep. I, look, I, uh, we could spend hours talking about this and I'd love to have maybe Lucian have us back, uh, Figaros, on another part of this. But BCS is now being asked and we're gaining membership um, from AE firms. Largest you know, AE firms in the country have joined our nonprofit. You know, HDR, Gensler, you know, Michael Baker, um, you know, Jacobs, uh, Parsons. And what they see is, OK, you've got this framework. How can we roll this into um, you know, our Division 25? How can we roll this into starting design charrettes, putting key performance parameters in place for cybersecurity of those systems, I mean, and then designing them in and making sure that they that cyber engineers and, and some AE firms are sending, setting up cyber practices to be able to accommodate this, which is difficult, different from mechanical electrical engineers having a cyber engineer saying, hey, I've got this tech package for a building. I've got to build this out. I want to do it in a way that's cyber safe. So you're starting to see this framework being moving to the left into the design process, which I think is fantastic. And Ken, one thing, one thread I want to pull is you mentioned the building, 2,000 IP devices. That's just for the building systems. That has nothing to do with people coming in, correct? Correct. Yeah, so lighting systems, um, plenums, uh, VVs, um, electrical, uh, so a whole host of systems in the building. And from a, you know, obviously one of the things we want to drive from building cyber is this cultural awareness today. And me working with other commercial real estate owners, one of the gaps that I see is the IT guys understand the IP and the IT world but they leave the OT, which is now all connected, you know, to the building engineers that may or may not have the skill set to manage that. You, can you comment a little bit on that from how you've seen changing your organization to help solidify, you know, a much more rigorous governance around OT cybersecurity? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've come a long way. I think we're by no means all the way there, right? And I'll give it a good example that's happened over the last week that sort of still represents that divide. But I do think in an organization, right, it really takes, um, it takes teamwork and communication, right? Uh, for us, the OT team, the facilities team had built out their own um, infrastructure. They were working with their third party vendors. They had signed up their own domain names and were using whatever connection they had put in those buildings to provide remote access and, and management of that building. Um, and, and so, you know, over the past few years, uh, we you know, from my perspective on, a, you know, coming from the IT side, it was our responsibility to show value add to them. How can we make your life easier? 
right? You know, we have areas of expertise in virtualization and networking and security and a variety of things, which they knew they needed to do, but really didn't have time, uh, didn't have the resources and so on. And so by doing the things that we're already good at and already know how to do and, and sort of bringing them into the fold, and again, looking that, at that infrastructure and those assets from a, um, a more holistic risk management perspective, it allowed them to focus on everything from the controller into the building. Right. So we give them something to plug their stuff into. We give them the infrastructure to run their applications on top of. They can do whatever they want to from that point. Right. But, you know, from our perspective, it's just a few different ports and protocols that we need to essentially keep an eye on. Um, you know, from a network segmentation standpoint, we've got important things to do there. Um, so, you know, monitoring and, and logging and all those sorts of things. Again, we can we can do all the basic blocking and tackling from the standpoint of what you would expect in an enterprise IT environment and, and enable them to better be able to manage um, their, their billing infrastructure. The flip side of that, right, and why, you know, I'm um, optimistic and excited to ultimately see some of these uh, requirements get put in um, from the construction side, right? We have, we're uh, very close to commissioning a, a, a building uh, in our portfolio, and we're going back and forth with the um, contractor on the electrical system. And they they put in they put in all their um, stuff, and you know they somehow they're having all these networking issues. They couldn't ping across the environment, and, and so on and so forth. Um, we spent a couple of days down working working through with them, and came to find out that um, they put in a series of unmanaged switches which weren't on the build sheet. They had everything they the unmanaged switches couldn't tag a particular VLAN, so ACLs couldn't get applied, and then ultimately um, things couldn't be pinged because they didn't put in default gateways on any of the endpoints, right? And so this is some basic sort of IT and networking stuff that they've, you know, from their perspective, had never had to do in the built environment when they built their own IT infrastructure, right? They didn't need these things the way they were set up. But the way that we've architected that campus and those buildings in it, we absolutely need some of those uh, key pieces of data to reside on those um, IP, to, IP to endpoints. Right. And so there's there's a communication barrier, there's a knowledge barrier, and it's it's just continued effort, I think, on the part of both teams to make sure that everybody's speaking the same language, that uh, everyone has everything they need before they start connecting and configuring things um, in that built environment, whether you're getting ready for commissioning, replacing an old system um, or, or doing some upgrades. Very insightful. Thank you. Hey, we have a question that came in and it's perfect for Lucian Niemeyer. What are your thoughts regarding some insurance providers attempting to carve out cyber attacks that may be attributed to certain nation states that by some definitions could be considered a terrorist attack? Yeah, I appreciate that, Bob. And uh, you know, that's a perfect <laughs> question. Um, so a lot of my time in Department of Defense, you know, we, spent, we try to figure out, you know, I think at high levels, we can attribute uh, sources for most uh, major cyber attacks. Um, but it is becoming murkier and murkier. Nation states definitely have the capability to mask or, uh, or hide, you know, what they're actually doing through a series of different uh, IP addresses. Um, and then we've got groups out there that may or may not be affiliated with nation states kind of carrying out their own attacks. And there's still the lone wolf concern. Yet some cyber terrorist has a way to inflict a lot of damage. Um, I understand exactly what you're asking about. The Lloyds of London have said acts of war or related to acts of war. I think that's a, that's written by lawyers. I think it's going to make lawyers rich for another 10 or 15 years uh, because of the fact that it's going to be really difficult to argue in court what was re related to an act of war. Um, similarly, right now, as you know, Colonial's uh, pipeline, they're still in court. They'll be in court for probably a decade trying to assess what's the term reasonable when it came to the cybersecurity program implemented by by. Um, by uh, uh, colonial, so you have you you have a, an amorphous nature to terms that ultimately will will be d d debated in court. Um, and mean, meanwhile, we're not putting that money to pure mitigation. So really, what BCS intended to do was try to come up with a national standard what reasonable is when it comes to OT. Um, but but really, it is going to be very difficult for anybody to argue that it was related to an act of war, which will be coming out of the cyber insurance world and then having a company, somebody come back and say, no, you know, I don't, I don't think so. I think it was purely just a, a, a dark actor and not affiliated with a nation state. I think you're going to see that play out. I mean, there's already been some court cases that have gone in the favor of the, of the, um, of, of uh, like for instance, uh, oh, um, Merck's 
uh, won a big one against their cyber insurance company, discussing whether they even should be covered in the beginning from a 2017 attack. We're going to see more, I think, in the favor away from cyber insurance towards their claimees or claimants on, on, on attack because it's difficult to pin down what's an active war. Hey, we have another question in for John. What is this? Hey, EJ, statistic? you're on mute. Oh. By the way, I do want to get the two questions that John posed. So we'll get those yeah. in a minute. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah. So what is the statistical results of this plan with insurance? As this was the talk of the time town five years ago. Yeah, no, there's been a lot, there's been a lot of discussion. And I gotta tell you, when we first started talking to underwriters, um, we got the same reaction. You know, come back to us when we start getting claims. Um, so yes, I think uh, there, there continues to need to be evolve um, the nature of risk. Um, one concern right now in the insurance industry, there just aren't enough stats to be able to determine the long-term uh, risk projection. Um, so it is more, uh, it is it's definitely an uphill battle getting them to agree. Yes, we want to encourage our, uh, our, our, our um, you know, our customers, our clients who want to spend money to mitigate the risk. Look, it's nothing that we have not done in the property casualty world. I mean, how many folks on the call here have checked that box for their homeowner's insurance policy? Hey, do you have a, you know, home security system? You know, look at your dog and, you know, yep, check. I got a, I got a home security system and you get a discount uh, for your, your, you know, on your home insurance policy. So that's, it's kind of similar, similar, and we'll continue um, to make the case. And yes, I think there are some insurers who are waking up saying, yeah, we definitely want to strongly encourage, even through financial means, to have our clients re reduce their cyber risk. And, and Ken, as a big need for property and casualty and cyber, how have you seen this change over the last, you know, six years since you've been there? From uh, you, you touched on it a little bit earlier with the questions being more thoughtful from them coming through, but I think more practical. Uh, experience from your side would be great. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's in line with what Lucian was saying, right? Um, you know, the insurers are getting smarter, the underwriters are getting smarter about it and the things that they're asking of us, right? You can't just check the box anymore. I also think on the asset um, owner operator side, there's more awareness with respect to um, I can check the box and get the discount, but then if I have a problem, I'm going to, they're going to come in and find that I really didn't do anything. Right. And, um, you know, my claim's going to be invalidated and I'm going to be, you know, I've paid this premium and I get no benefit. Right. Yeah, and so that, I, the, the yeah, don't mean to interrupt there, Kim. That's exactly what happened with travelers, right? The recent case against travelers, where travelers assumed that the, their client had MFA, multi path authentication. Turns out they did not and they denied the claim. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But yeah, no, I, but I think that's that's exactly it. Right. There's there's. Um, I'm sure there's a handful of folks out there who, who were able to get a policy or get somebody to, you know, underwrite them. And, you know, it, at the end of the day, it might not be worth the paper that is written on, you know, um, because the, the insurance company, I would fully expect is going to come in and start asking a lot of questions. Um, also, you know, working with the um, incident response entity, whoever comes in, and, you know, based on their report and assessment of, of what happened. Right. So, you know, it's, there's also more thought, I think, going into when would we actually engage, right? Now, the insurance companies want you to engage as soon as you think something might happen, right? And they provide all sorts of resources for you to do that. But, you know, there's two sides of that. It's in their benefit to, to see something as early as possible to, to understand. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, um, we're also, you know, it's not even so much the insurance company. We didn't really touch on this yet, but as a publicly traded company, having you know what may be new requirements to report publicly, um, you know, due to SEC rules, right? That that all of this is going to play together, right? Reporting the SEC, you know, reporting and engaging the insurance company and executing your policy based on whatever the incident was and what I think the impact is. Um, there's a comment I think in the chat about you know first sign of ransomware coming to hardline. You know, we did a tabletop exercise within our company, and there's still that mentality within um, our building uh, building system team up to the senior, you know, senior executive level of, well, I can just disconnect the building and, you know, move levers, right, or whatever I need to do. Um, that really doesn't account for the fact that the, the controls, uh, control systems within that building may be totally unusable, right? And you've got stuff that's behind drywall, you know, up 20 feet in the air, um, it has to get replaced. You probably don't have it sitting in a closet somewhere. 
Um, so there's going to be business, you know, impact, business downtime, impact to tenants, um, and on and on from there. Um, so, you know, add to that, who knows how long that adversary, you know, had established persistence in your environment, how much it had replicated across that environment. Um, if it's sitting and lying in wait somewhere else that you unplug this box and ex execute on, on another box, um, you know, so there's there's all sorts of different dynamics here that, uh, you know, when you think about the controls that are being applied across an environment, uh, you know, 100, 150 controls may seem like a daunting list, but they're there for a reason, you know, to sort of accommodate and account for different types of scenarios um, that may ultimately uh, affect your environment. Yeah, just to add to that, I think, you know, what you're seeing right now is ransomware definitely has a, a, a recon and a persistent uh, a preface to it. So once you get actually hit with a ransomware attack, it's most likely the bad actor has been in there for a week. So in the case of Colonial, they locked up the backups. They encrypted the backups as well. So I think you're starting to see that in a lot of more sophisticated ransomware attacks. They are taking out the backups ahead of time because they've been in your network already for a week planning the attack. Yeah, and I would say my involvement through this and, and working with the insurance companies, we, we met with one insurance executive and he goes, Apple creates a new product every year. He goes, we haven't we're lucky if we get one in a decade, right? So we're now on a point from the insurance guys, you know, these siloed products, one from property and casualty, which is really driven about securing that asset, cybersecurity about securing the risk of the organization. How do those things get blended together? Because now the OT impacts the BC, the P and C, not necessarily the cyber. So I think they're trying to figure out how they create the hybrid products to meet the needs of, of guys like Ken. And it's going to take some time, right? So we've, we've had this discussion with respect to just the company's sort of continuity of operations and disaster recovery planning, you know, and, and I've had that previous organizations much larger than COPT where, you know, it's how do you accommodate um, cybersecurity incident response in the context of a larger continuity of operations plan? Because you have pandemics, you have fire, you have property and casualty, you have all these other sorts of things. And, you know, cybersecurity is an appendix essentially to that overall plan. Now we have a plan, we can execute it in that type of environment, but it needs to roll up to something larger. And, and I think that's something the insurance um, industry is going to, like you said, it's going to struggle with and it's going to take some time for them to figure that out. Lucian, what are the things that keep you up at night? <laughs> well, I haven't slept in five years ever since I got my, I don't know how can you actually lived uh, up at Fort Meade. I got uh, like three briefings there and I couldn't sleep for like five years after that. Um, it's pretty amazing, you know, what the damage that can be caused. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I testified before Congress plenty of times when I was in the Department of Defense and at, they asked me, you know, on okay, what resili resilience challenges are you most concerned about? Um, and as you know, in this country, we're talking, you know, we have grid resilience, we have environmental resilience, everybody's, you know, worried about climate change and, and uh, you know, all these different potential natural disasters. I'm, I'm completely consumed by the fact that our society can change in a matter of hours. You know, you know our, our, our way of life, our, the degree for which we approach things with either confidence or fear um, can be fundamentally altered by one cyber attack. Um, you know, being fearful in your home, being fearful of your water, being fearful of, you know, the, the power going off. Um, I, am, I, am, I am absolutely um, passionately involved in wanting to, to mitigate that risk uh, from a cyber attack that can devastate us. So um, that's keeping them up at night that we, that we have not moved as quickly as we can on getting this framework out. Um, I definitely do not want a national black swan event, which uh, for, for those of us in that security means a significant uh, 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 event that drives institutional or change. I hate the fact that government's in crisis response and not in proactive leadership. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes I'm, I wake up in the morning and I'm thinking, I'm, we're trying so hard to get this out there. In some cases, people are not really paying attention or, or they just prioritize other risks as more important. Um, so how can we, without causing alarms, without creating fear, without saying the sky is falling, how can we offer a solution that people say, you know what, that's sensible, that mitigates risk, definitely we want to do this. So it's just just get trying to get the word out and get folks to, 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 uh, to, to want to get involved. Yeah, Ken, I'll throw that same question to you. Yeah, and so, you know, thinking about uh, Lucian's comments, right? So, yeah, I grew up, I grew up in the world of nuclear weapons, nuclear command and control, um, really bad day kind of stuff, 
right? Now, while a lot of that still exists today and, and you know, um, somewhat shocked it's been in the news lately, right? This is just the, the um, 2000, you know, 2022 version of that, right? When we talk about cyber attacks and critical infrastructure. And, you know, from my standpoint, um, we, we do as much as we can, you know, where, where we sit, right? Everybody has a role to play, um, you know, in trying to move initiatives forward to help us from a societal aspect, right? Where I sit is, you know, you know, today with respect to the, these uh, buildings that COP owns and operates and, and the folks that we support that are within them. You know, I think resiliency is not um, an overused term, at least not yet, right? Because we're not going to prevent every attack. Um, we're, something's going to happen. Um, it's how do we operate through and recover from uh, an event like that, and you know, not similar, you know, no, not dissimilar to my previous life, right? It's, you know, the whole goal there is to um, sort of, you know, provide an enduring way forward, um, you know, that we can uh, do our best to recover from, right? And you know, while COP is not going to play in the sort of black swan type of event, I'll be at home, hopefully with my family, and and move on from there. Um, we are, you know, do want to, um, you know, do what we can to, you know, continue to support a national security mission. Like I said, we have a very symbiotic relationship with the folks in those buildings uh, and ensure that they can, they can do what they need to do, right, at the end of the day, right? And that's, you know, all of our tenants, you know, whether it's Transamerica, you know, in, in downtown Baltimore or Pandora, you know, making bracelets or, you um, you know, uh, government agencies that, that we have. And so, you know, um, I do have a lot more gray hair than I used to. Uh, I try to get sleep, but um, I, I do think that, you know, we're doing, we're doing the best we can. Um, you know, there's always more that can be done, but I think, you know, engaging with, um, you know, organizations like this and, and others can you know, continue to push the message about, you know, options that people have, try to help educate folks on, on what they can do to help us all, um, I think is really important. Yeah. Hey, one thing, uh, EJ, one thing, EJ, I want to pick up on uh, something that Ken just said, and that's, uh, you know, how do we practice, you know, response from a cyber attack? Um, I, I've been in plenty of uh, incident response scenarios and mechanisms where you're in a simulated command center and in comes a ransomware attack and, you know, and people get stunned and then they say, okay, let's shut down the computers. Let's, you know, segment and move, isolate, move on to the backups. Um, and yes, th those are all really valid steps and I highly encourage anybody on this call uh, that's a CISO or CIO is you definitely should engage in an incident, you know, have a team come in and give you a scenario and respond to that. But if there's one thing to, uh, to respond and be able to restore your networks and your business operations um, and your data, it's a whole other thing to realize you have people's lives at stake. Uh, our, our framework emphasizes life, safety, health. Um, you have to go through a fundamental set of, of different decisions if you're having an OT attack. Perfect examples. We run through a scenario where a facility manager gets a gets an email on a 5:30 morning. Hey, we seized your elevators, um, and and we seized your fire controls. So it's not a matter of okay, let's check. You know, let's see if it's real or not. You know, let's see. You know, if we can get them back. Is what do you tell the tenants in that first five minutes? Do you use the elevators? Do you use, do you evacuate the building? What's the risk to the folks that are in your building? How quickly do you have to make decisions about uh, about preserving their safety and their life. It's a fundamentally different set of questions. It's a fundamentally different thing that you have to take a look at. Now, I don't think we've really done a nearly enough um, un understanding of an IT attack is different than an OT attack. An OT attack can hurt somebody. And how do you respond to that in a way that, that prioritizes pr preservation of life, health, and safety? So that's kind of why uh, in our framework, and that's why we call ourselves Although we are aligned on the IT side with the Center for Internet Security, we call ourselves predominantly a, an OT cybersecurity framework with an emphasis on preserving life, safety, and health of occupants. Um, that's why we think we've got ourselves a little bit of a different model here that, that is compelling for the public safety, no matter where, where you are, in your home, your cars, transportation, or in buildings. Thanks for that, Lucian. Ken, when you mentioned some of your tenants. Are you starting to see the tenants ask you in their leases for what are you doing from a cyber perspective? Um, on the government side, we have. 
Uh, we've actually had a few leases that have been modified to include a standard um, to which they they want um, our properties to meet. Um, so we're working our way in that direction. Really, it's based upon a series of NIST requirements. Um, but on the commercial side, um, I've only had probably one or two uh, prospective tenants actually ask the question, and they were defense contractors, right? Um, you know, interested in what we were doing, um, how we did it, uh, and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, put the slides together, put the, you know, the narrative together, give them some background information, um, and, you know, and everybody kind of, you know, nods and walks away. Um, but again, it was very ad hoc, right? Um, I do, even though it's it's more work for us, I am encouraged that, you know, again, on the government side, um, we're starting to tackle this problem of what to do with lease facilities um, and that we have a set of criteria to work from. And, and while there's still a lot of unknowns around the process, right, who ultimately at the end of the day is signing off on accepting that risk and, you know, how that risk is managed and how that information is shared between landlord and lessee. Um, we're working our way through it, right? And it all goes to that relationship that we have with the tenant and, and you know, and it's not just um, so, and cutting checks uh, on a recurring basis. It's really uh, opening up, sharing that information, engaging in the dialogue. Here's why we're choosing to do something the way that we are. Um, you know, the government's kind of unique in that they can't really dictate the solution, you know, because even though it's a lease, they look at, they look at us as a contractor um, and the rules that are sort of around that. Um, but again, you know, we want to really sort of pare it down to getting the technical folks around the table, under, you know, everybody sort of understanding and being as, as, in as much agreement as we can be um, on, a, on a way forward with respect to the controls and the capabilities that we put in. And, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that we're going to emerge um, if, uh, you know, as good or if not in a better posture than um, if the government had done it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously one of the tenets of building cyber is building this culture. It takes everyone within the organization to mm -hmm. drive it, right? Similar to safety. So another question came in about Lloyd's dropping yeah, I'm reading their it. coverage. Yeah. Um, yeah. What does that mean for the other insurance companies? Yeah. Any insight so on first that? Of all, so I, yeah, I think I made a mistake being a winner. I put, asked for put questions in chat. Uh, Lucian for Garth has made very clear. Put it, the questions in Q&A so you, they can keep a record. Uh, but let's go to the question itself from Fred. And it's a great question uh, because you're right. Uh, and, and Lloyd's gave out guidance on, on how to characterize risk. Uh, but you're right. There, there, I think there are some subsidiaries of Lloyd that say no more uh, cyber insurance um, tied to a nation state attack because it's such a catastrophic risk issue. Um, I, I, that look, I think in this country, we're looking at potentially federally backed um, catastrophic loss um, uh, policies. Yeah, I'm not sure how do you characterize that with a rapidly evolving threat. We're not talking flood, you know, where there's 200 years of data here. You don't quite know what you're getting yourself into when it comes to a catastrophic loss from a cyber attack. So I think there is some um, volatility right now. If if companies are not going to give out cyber insurance policies, who is or backed by what? Um, so we are in an inflection point. That's kind of why we feel, OK, we can discuss about transferring all you want. But at some point, it's going to get too costly. I think uh, Ken mentioned it earlier, cyber policies are going up. So why not invest in mitigation instead? I mean, at some point, you've got to make a business case. Do I take the risk of buying a policy that's worth nothing and spending a lot of money? Or do I take that money and just start buying down and mitigating my risk? Uh, particularly using a standard that is well known and can be defended in the C-suite. Ken's right. Uh, what the SEC, the United States, is asking for as far as a, a, a you know to go ahead a part of your filings annually to tell your shareholders um, or your investors what your cyber posture is, what cyber programs you have, you know what cyber governance you have. This is only going to become more acute on degree for what you want to continue to take risk in how you transfer, or do you just start you start uh, uh, killing it or burning it down uh, with investments and hopefully in the in a certification through BCS. Yeah, and I think that that sort of circling back and investing in, in yourself, right, is going to pay off for everybody in the end versus just trying to transfer the risk over to an insurance company. And, and granted, for small organizations, that, that becomes more and more, that, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but um, I do think there's there's ways to get there. The other thing I would just, again, beat the drum here on this comment too, you know, when we talk about incidents caused by nation state hackers, um, again, I, I think it's it's more of a red herring to keep the lawyers engaged. 
it, it's in extraordinarily difficult and it has been for decades to appropriately apply attribution um, to uh, a, a cyber actor, right? You know, if you take something like Stuxnet where the code was made, made it out in the wild, does that mean that somebody who decided to reuse the basis of that code, but modified it in some meaningful way for themselves to use it is still, you know, at, uh, putting a result on as a, a, you know, due to a nation state actor, right? So like code is code and code, you know, can replicate and go anywhere. You know, and, and, you know, that was a major concern from an offensive standpoint um, when I wore that hat um, many moons ago as well, is that it, it's is very different from dropping a 500 pound bomb on a target in that once you drop it, that bomb is gone. When you hit the enter button on a, on a, a piece of code that you have to take into consideration that code is out there um, if you haven't put in uh, means and methods to, to get rid of it. And so once somebody else takes it, what does that mean? Right. And what was it really the Russians or the Iranians or, um, you know, the U.S. or somebody else behind that? Um, it, it's it, it's going to be a very difficult, interesting question as, as things continue to move forward. And, and you know, what that means in the context of these policies um, is going to tie up the legal system for a while. Yeah, Ken, I mean, it, talk about the proverbial head in the sound, right? Right. From Lloyd's. Let's just go mm -hmm. ahead and just assume the problem goes away and it's not. All you're going to do is just create more controversy and more legal fees. And again, I go back to what I said, would you rather just spend money on mitigating risk or paying lawyers to try to defend yep. what you did not do? Yeah, and, and the really uh, intelligent thing 62443 did was it is risk-based. The standard is risk-based, right? So how much investment in, in at least this particular industry segment of commercial real estate the investment and the risk of a self-storage facility and the cyber protections around that are very different than what you have with thousands of people going into that building every day from the health and safety side. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're at the top of the hour and I'm, I'm watching. I think we're starting to lose folks. Is there any last comments? First of all, EJ, we didn't have a chance to ask you a question. You've put your life into the BCS framework. You know, where do you want to take it? Yeah, so I, I would say short term, just from the technical working group, before Thanksgiving, we'll be putting out, in essence, a pre-qualification, 17 questions to ask yourselves of, am I ready to even do a assessment? So, you know, that's the next step of what we're trying to do. And then ultimately roll this out to a lot more building owners to really protect assets. You know, and then from a day job, we design and deploy those networks, you know, using a Fortinet firewall and all of the secure things that we need to ensure that none of this happens on the front end from the design side. Cool. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Um, well, obviously, Lucian Figaro's, thank you for having us and be happy to follow up on any of the other questions in writing thereafter. Yeah, I appreciate it. And everybody, give us give us your joy on the surveys um, so we can actually come back and talk some more. Um, so thank you, Ken, and thank you, uh, EJ, for uh, a, hopefully a great discussion. There's, yeah, there's thank, the you. thank you. Thank you all. All the best, guys. Thank you. We look forward to have you back. Thank you all for great insights uh, from uh, cyber insurance to zero trust security. Yeah. We look forward to have you back. Uh, October 26, we have the uh, industrial metaverse, uh, C-suit uh, sort of a forum and the manufacturing day on December 6 and 7. With this uh, concludes the program for today. Appreciate the speakers, Mr. Niemeyer, uh, Schomburg and uh, uh, Mr. Kurz. Uh, have a great day.